You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. I have a very special guest co-host today, Jen Lewis, who is the fundraising and outreach manager for the Point Cabrillo Lightkeepers Association in California. Hi, Jen. Hey, Jeremy. How's it going? Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this today. Jen, uh, you've been on the podcast a few times, including pretty recently, and I thought you'd be a perfect co-host for this episode, which is going to focus on the Yaquina Head and Yaquina Bay Lighthouses in Oregon. I know you have a special connection with those. Later, we're going to talk about a special event, a Valentine's Day event that's coming up at Absecon Lighthouse in New Jersey also. Before all that, let's talk a little bit about Point Cabrillo, your uh, your home base there, Point Cabrillo Lighthouse. We did a special edition of the podcast a couple of weeks ago uh, where you talked about some recent damage. Uh, on the morning of January 5th, Point Cabrillo Lighthouse was hit by at least one massive wave that broke open the back doors and flooded the interior of the building. So, Jen, can you update us? How's the cleanup progressing? It is progressing really, really well. Uh, we have had an incredible team of volunteers that have been there basically every day since January 5th, uh, rotating through a bunch of our awesome folks that live out here on the Mendocino coast. And we've dried out all the displays. We've separated out all the gift shop stuff and we are, um, we're making big moves. It's been really exciting to see the community gather around us and really support us during all of this. So we've made a lot of big steps and we're getting really close to reopening. Wow. So uh, we talked about how a lot of the the, um, gift shop merchandise was damaged in that flood. I saw something, I think it was on Facebook. Are you actually going to be selling some of the damaged goods as sort of a souvenir of the event? (laughs) We sure are. Yeah, there is a lot of product that was damaged, but it wasn't damaged beyond repair. Um, so we have a lot of things that have gone through, gone through the washing machine, gone through the dryer that we're selling, um, you know, 25, 40% off. And we'll also have a lot of items that uh, we just, we felt too sad to throw away. So we'll have those out as a make a donation table as well. Um, mm. So we are actually planning on being open on Saturday, January 28th. And uh, Um, After that, we'll have all those tables out there. So anyone who comes and visits after that time, I'm sure we'll we'll have a good selection of our storm product out for a while. Um, But yeah, we're just we're just so honored that the community wants to support us and everyone's getting so excited to just walk inside the lighthouse again. It's been a while. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. I was thinking, uh, you know, we've heard of uh, fire sale, but not I think flood sales are are not as well known as fire sales. Uh, (laughs) But Yeah, we're speaking on January 27th, but people will be hearing this on February 5th. So uh, you just said that you're uh, planning to reopen uh, tomorrow, January 28th. So by the time people are hearing this, uh, things will hopefully be back in full swing. Uh, That's pretty exciting. It is. We are so excited about it. Yeah. Good luck with everything that's happening there. Uh, Congratulations on the progress that's been made since that happened. I know it was uh, kind of shocking (laughs) at the time, (laughs) to say the least. Uh, So let's move on to today's main topic, which is two Oregon lighthouses, Yaquina Head and Yaquina Bay. And Jen, I believe you have kind of a personal, personal connection to these places. I sure do. So I grew up in Central Oregon. Um, My family is all in the Bend, Oregon area. And so all of our trips when we were kids was right over to the Oregon coast. And for the most part, it was right there in Newport. We spent a lot of time in that whole area where Yaquina Head and Yaquina Bay are. And um, Yaquina Head was the first lighthouse that I actually remember visiting as a kid. So that was that was one of the places that first um, started my love for lighthouses, my love for history and the ocean. And so I have a lot, a lot, a lot of love for that lighthouse. I remember when I was very small, I got to actually climb up all the steps to the top and I got one of those pins that said, you climbed the however many steps it was to the top of your Quinn Head Lighthouse. <laughs> 
Um, so that's it's a memory that is very, very cemented in my mind, uh, traveling there with my mom and my sisters. Um, the Oregon coast is such a beautiful area, but the Yaquina Head Lighthouse and the Yaquina Bay Lighthouse are two really special places. Yes, I completely agree. Where where you are in Northern California is pretty spectacular too. But I do like it here too. <laughs> I, I I know you do, and uh, it's it's beautiful. But the Oregon coast is a is a very very special place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, at this point, Jen, if you could help uh, help me tell our listeners a little bit more about the the uh, two Yuquina lighthouses and about today's guests. Sure thing. So the town of Newport on the Central Oregon coast is home to two picturesque lighthouses at Yaquina Head and Yaquina Bay. The word Yaquina comes from the name of the Yaquina tribe that inhabited the area. Yaquina Bay, the place where the Yaquina River empties into the Pacific about two thirds of the way up the Oregon coast, became a center of lots of maritime activity by the 1860s with the shipping of logs, fish, and oysters. Yaquina Bay Lighthouse, a pretty two-story dwelling with an attached square wooden tower, began service in November 1871. It's believed to be the oldest building in Newport, and it's the only surviving wooden lighthouse built by the federal government in Oregon. A short time later, less than four miles to the north, another lighthouse was built at Yaquina Head. A powerful first-order lens at that location went into service in August of 1873. The 93-foot-tall brick tower is Oregon's tallest lighthouse tower. It became clear that keeping both lights in operation was a poor use of public funds, and the Aquina Bay Light was discontinued on October 1, 1874, ending its life as an active federal aid to navigation after only a little more than three years. Abandoned and neglected as the years passed, Aquina Bay Lighthouse developed a ghostly appearance. It also picked up some ghostly legends to match its look. A lease on the property was granted to the Lincoln County Historical Society in 1956. With the help of the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, the lighthouse was eventually refurbished. Yaquina Head Light Station was automated and de-staffed in 1966. All the other buildings have been demolished over the years, but the lighthouse tower underwent a nearly $1 million restoration over six months, beginning in December 2005. The Yaquina Head Interpretive Center is open daily, and the lighthouse itself is sometimes opened for limited ranger-led tours. Friends of Yaquina Lighthouses, a nonprofit organization formed in 1988, now partners with the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department and the U.S. Bureau of Land Management to support the preservation and interpretation of the Yaquina Head and Yaquina Bay Lighthouses. We have two guests today. Amy Anderson is the Executive Director of Friends of Yaquina Lighthouses, and Andrew Smalden is an Education Technician for the Yaquina Head Outstanding Natural Area. I spoke to Amy and Andrew recently via Zoom, so let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with Amy Anderson, the Executive Director of Friends of Yaquina Lighthouses, and also Andrew Smalden, Education Technician for the Yaquina Head Outstanding Natural Area. So thank you so much, Amy and Andrew, for being with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Starting out here, just to clarify things, I find it a little confusing, but I'm wondering if you can explain a little about how the two lighthouses are managed, the Yaquina Head and Yaquina Bay Lighthouses. And part two of that is how the Friends of Yaquina Lighthouses help with the, uh, the preservation and interpretation of those sites. Sure, so I can at least take the first part of it. So Oregon Parks and Recreation Department manages Yaquina Bay Lighthouse, and then Yaquina Head is managed by a federal agency, the Bureau of Land Management, though the Coast Guard takes care of lenses in both lighthouses. We have a formal arrangement with the BLM, so we're a cooperating association which gives us permission to operate um, a retail operation inside the interpretive center. We don't currently have a formal arrangement with uh, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, but we do raise money if they have any um, need. Most recently, we raised some money for some historic siding replacement on Yaquina Bay. Yeah, so the Friends, um, Friends Group raises money for both lighthouses through a combination of means. We uh, write grants, we take donations, uh, we do retail sales, 
um, and we have a membership program. And so all of those generate funds that we then um, can donate back to either Lighthouse for any preservation projects um, or interpretation projects that um, for whatever reason, the agency that manages one or other of the lighthouses doesn't necessarily have in their budget. Sometimes it takes a while for an agency to get moving. <laughs> There's a, a lot of moving parts to have to get going in the right direction. And it's often just easier for us to come up with whatever funds are needed and just do the project. Um, so we do that throughout the year, stuff that the budget shortfalls or they just, it needs to be done in a timely manner and we just can't get the machine moving fast enough for that. On my end, we uh, we work with them uh, through the bookstore here at uh, Yaquinahan uh, Interpretive Center and just a great group of folks to work with, knowledgeable, friendly, and uh, always willing to help. And those are volunteers for the Friends Group, is that is that correct on the site there? We have there? a small paid staff, um, okay. so mm -hmm. I'm full-time and I have one full-time a store coordinator who helps with ordering and managing the store. And then we have three part-time staff who also are up in the store. And then we have two full-time volunteers that are um, here at the Interpretive Center greeting, greeting visitors and also um, working at the cash register at the store. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for clarifying all that. So, Amy, let me ask you, uh, how did you personally get involved with Friends of Equina Lighthouses? Um, I studied natural resource management at um, Oregon State University, and from there took a job with Oregon Parks and Recreation Department in um, a local campground doing nighttime education. Loved, absolutely loved that, but it was a nighttime job. Because that's when the, the campers want to attend the programs, and I did have small children. Um, so I did that for six or seven years, and then started looking around for something that would allow me to still be at a public land site here in the community, but also have a full-time daytime job. And um, I'd known about Friends of Yaquina Lighthouses um, because I had been involved with Yaquina Bay through the park system. And when this job came up, I applied and lo and behold, I've been here for eight years now. So mm -hmm. it was a good, it was a good moment for me. Yeah. Well, that sounds like an excellent fit. <laughs> and uh, Andrew, you are involved in education for the Aquina Head Outstanding Natural Area. What what sorts of things do you do in that position? Every spring, we get a large number of school groups come to visit the Aquina Head uh, Outstanding Natural Area. So we have some pretty well-developed education programs based on this curriculum for the state and the class level or the grade level of the students. Uh, some of the programs focus on our tide pool education. Uh, so we're down there in the tide pools, uh, helping students with that kind of science-based material. And then we also do lighthouse programs for students as well. And we're starting to get more involved with um, other groups. There's one group out there a STEM hub, which is focusing on uh, science and engineering. And because the lighthouse is such a great example of an engineering marvel, uh, we get requests from them to, to participate. And the last couple of years, we've been doing a lot of virtual programs with uh, the way everything's been. And we, I was part of a team that won an award for our virtual education programs. We uh, just had a great staff that came in and adapted what we had been doing in person to being able to do it for classes online. And uh, it's worked out really good over the last year or two. Oh, that's great. Oh, congratulations on that award. That's, uh, yeah, the uh, virtual programs are something we've all had to get used to. And uh, it's uh, it's nice to have both. Uh, I think virtual programs will continue, but uh, the uh, the in-person things are so important. Uh, let's talk about the history of the two sites. First of all, in general, why were aids to navigation needed so badly in that area? When Oregon was being developed, there was a lot of people coming across the Oregon Trail, of course, but the other way to get here was uh, coming around the Horn or eventually the Isthmus of Panama. And there was going to be a need for lighthouses, especially along the Oregon coast. It's got a lot of really rugged, rocky terrain along it from some of the volcanic uh, history of the coast. 
and that was presented a really big difficulty for mariners. And so having this system of lighthouses was going to alleviate uh, some of those problems for them over time. And it just took a while to develop. Uh, the first lighthouse, I think, on the Oregon coast was down on the Rogue River area in the 18, late 1850s. And it's, uh, they were finding gold down there. It might have been one of the reasons that spot got chosen first. So Yaquina Bay Lighthouse came first of the two, but it, it wasn't active for very long, at least in its first in, incarnation. Uh, just was it like three years uh, thereabouts. Uh, why was it only active for such a short time? Kind of one way to talk about it is that it, it was kind of like a exit sign on a highway, <laughs> uh, taking you to one location on the coast. Uh, and it was replaced eventually by the Yaquina Headlight uh, Station, which would have served a, a broader purpose for commerce up and down the coast entirely. So it was larger. Uh, ships were able to see it farther away. And then uh, they eventually the Yaquina Bay Lighthouse was replaced by some range lights entering uh, the the bar there at Yaquina. And one of the reasons it was initially developed, Yaquina Bay, was because of the, the treacherous nature of the Yaquina bar, these sand shoals that are always moving. And early on, they, they would want a pilot that would know uh, where the current conditions of the, of the entry for that port was. Mm -hmm. That was still going to be needed, even though uh, the Bay Lighthouse wasn't used anymore. Uh, but it was definitely a part of a, a longer range goal to have larger lighthouses rather than the smaller one like Yaquina Bay. And from what I've read, uh, Yaquina Head Light is certainly in a, in a rugged location and probably uh, kind of an isolated location at the time the lighthouse was built uh, in 18, well, it went to service in 1873. How long did it take to build? And I understand that that process was quite, quite difficult. It was a really difficult process. And, and just to think back at that time when in the 1870s, getting supplies to a remote location like this uh, would just at times take months and months. The weather was a big impediment and the location was as well. Uh, in clear weather, a ship could anchor off the Yaquina point and drop supplies on the beach which the keepers then have to bring up or the workmen would, but that wasn't always the case. So they would have to go into Yaquina Bay, uh, have things dropped off there and on clear weather, have it shipped back out to the head. Uh, there wasn't a road early on. The earliest folks getting there by foot probably used the beach to, to get uh, up to the work site as what they were doing. It took about two and a half years or so for the tower to be completed and, and get the light illuminated. One of the things that happened during those two years is one of the ship captains that was delivering the components for the lens, the Fresnel lens, uh, hit a big storm, thought he was going to sink. So he threw all those pieces overboard and it turns out he didn't sink. He made it to the site and that was a became a, a nine month delay in, in mm. finding, ordering, and, and really making those new lens parts. Wow, yeah, it wasn't a, a simple thing for sure. As I understand it, uh, a duplex house was built for the keepers at Equina Head, and later on, quite a bit later, an additional house was added for three keepers and their families. And let me just interject before I kind of finish that question. Uh, we just talked about the light being established in 1873, which makes it the 150th anniversary this year. And I want to talk more about that in a few minutes. I don't want to forget about that. But again, there was a duplex house and later an additional house. Uh, as many as three keepers and their families lived there. Uh, what was life like for the keepers there? Was it an extremely isolated place to, to live in those days? They were about um, five miles out of town uh, with no road. So it was kind of like a farm-like situation, a beautiful place to be, of course, along the Oregon coast. But they wanted to supplement what was supplied to them from the lighthouse uh, service. 
They did have supplies dropped off four times a year on a quarterly basis. Uh, but the keepers had a great big garden. They had uh, barns, chicken coops, hogs. And we know from having some of their keeper logs what they, they went fishing just about every day. Uh, they went looking for agates and clams and hunting. It had some perks with it, but it was definitely isolated. Uh, eventually, Agate Beach would be a little closer development. Uh, the school kids would, uh, the kids would be able to go to school. And it was a, a stable job, but maybe it wasn't for everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, you're in the same place when, you know, a lot of, the country around you is up and growing and people are moving in. Uh, you're in a position where you have uh, to look out every day and night and keep your post, so to speak. Yeah. How did the kids go to school? Did they walk to school? Did they uh, board with somebody to go to school or were they homeschooled some of the during some of the, the years? I think a little bit of everything. Um, the kids early on were probably taught by one of the keeper's wives if there were enough kids around. We have a few oral histories that previous family members that lived out here um, have provided us with. And uh, by, say, around the 19 teens and 20s, there was a, a school uh, closer by that the kids could walk to and mm -hmm. as the area was growing. Prior to that, though, uh, it was probably just uh, mom educating you. Possibly the, the Lighthouse Service did provide a traveling libraries. So that right. might have been a form of education for um, the kids as well as the, the keepers to be entertained, too. Yeah. Well, those tra traveling libraries were, were a great thing for those families. I can say, um, I can say here as well that um, we do on site have the keeper's garden that we restored. Um, the friends group maintains that on an annual basis. We have uh, we buy from a historic seed catalog, mm. and that's part of the educational program here on site. So we can actually take groups down there and show them, you know, exactly what they were growing, how they were doing it, and, and work that into the isolation and, and the story of some of the hardships that the families. Um, endured while working for the lighthouse. Wow. That's fantastic. What a, what a great thing to have there. So uh, for either of you, is there anything else uh, you'd like to mention, anything that stands out as far as the, the lives of keepers and families there? Any interesting personalities or interesting incidents that happened over the years? We're, we're very thankful to have gotten the uh, keepers logs from uh, the archives in Washington, D.C. through uh, Candace Clifford and her mother. Yes. Yeah, just, they are such an amazing resource. One of my jobs is to, to transcribe them. And yeah, there's just been so many interesting things that have happened here. One keeper early on was named uh, Frank Plummer, and he was one of the longest serving keepers from the 1880s into around the turn of the century. He was told to write more, be more descriptive in the keeper logs by the engineers and by the inspectors that came. And so through his details, we really know a little bit more about what happened. They had to deal with um, buoys uh, disappearing. Uh, they had to deal with the shipwrecks that happened. One in particular happened in uh, the 1890s and a couple um sailors on a ship that was transporting a load of coal from Alaska down to San Francisco happened to be going by Yaquina Head in the morning. And they went into the hold where the potatoes were stored and kind of near the coal and the coal dust ignited and blew up the ship. Mm. And so the keepers helped save the seamen as they came in, three boats made it to the lighthouse. Captain Chapman unfortunately passed away along with a couple others, but uh, they were instrumental in, in providing refuge for these sailors and getting them into town, reporting to the company what happened. And so those were kind of some of the exciting days that a keeper would see rather than uh, just reporting about the weather a lot of times and, and those quiet days that go by. Well, speaking of the weather, anything that stands out as far as uh, storms, and I want to talk about recent history too, but going back 
to the days of uh, keepers and families living there. Is there any, were there any particularly huge storms uh, that maybe damaged the place or just uh, were memorable in one way or another? One thing that keepers write about frequently is having that duplex, that two-story house out on that point. They get winds all the time, you know, and here in Oregon, it's straight line winds over 100 miles an hour. Uh, in other parts of the country, they might be considered hurricanes or tornadoes. And, uh, here, we just get heavy damaging winds. Yeah. Um, they were known to kick up rocks from the cliff face and break the windows of the house. <sighs> wow. So the keepers would have to uh, constantly repair those houses. And when the, the two-story Victorian was going to get um, replaced in the late 1930s, by that time, it had been around for a good 50 years or so, and um, the keepers didn't really go into the parlor, the front rooms as much because the windows had broken so often, the floorboards were moldy and dilapidated, and it, so it did affect them kind of on a daily basis that way. For us, we've had a pretty good winter here this year. Um, there's been some high tides. It's currently king tides this weekend. And uh, we've seen uh, waves come all the way up the Cobble Beach, uh, maybe a, a foot above the, the cliff. And, and we've seen some rock fall and some small landslides. Uh, about a year ago almost now, we did um, uh, get some influence from the Tongan tsunami. Hmm. A real nice clear day brought really big waves that are, are unusual for the weather that we were having. So um, that's something more recent. Uh, of course, the earthquake in Japan several years ago, we had debris uh, float up on both beaches north and south of us, and we tracked that. The whole state of Oregon did a good job at following tsunami debris. How high is that bluff where the lighthouse stands? It's approximately about 120 feet. Uh, yeah. The tower is 93 feet. Uh, it makes it about 200 feet above the sea level when you're right. in but it's incredible to think of uh, the seas, the wind and seas throwing water and rocks up as, as high as the, the light station there and breaking yeah. windows in the house and so forth. That's absolutely incredible to me. But in recent years, uh, nothing like that is, has happened. Of course, the, uh, the house, the old house isn't there anymore. But. Yeah, there's definitely um, several different geologic formations that uh, historically used to be present here. One is a, a rock pillar called the Duchess, and that was washed away in the high waves probably a good 60, 70 years ago, I guess now. Uh, another real popular 1890s geologic formation in Newport was uh, called Jump Off Joe. And it looked like a great big shoe. And that whole thing is gone now. And there have been some landslides that affect the town, both north and south of the head here. And yeah, that's the roads buckling. So there are issues happening with the storms today. Even with this week, south uh, southern Oregon had 101 closed due to a landslide. Wow. So with all that kind of activity, is the lighthouse uh, endangered or is there a fear that it will be endangered in not too many more years? You know, it's on a volcanic outcropping and that's pretty solid stuff. All the, the rocks around it are still present. It, yet there is going to be some erosion and, and I think that eventually it'll be a problem, but I don't think it's anytime real soon. That, mm -hmm. um, we'll have to worry about the lighthouse. I think it's it's doing pretty good for now and ready for yeah. 150 years. Nobody wants to be in part of the lighthouse when it falls, right? BLM does an excellent job of ensuring the safety of the tower. Um, engineers are here annually and things are inspected all of the time. So I, I think that we're good there. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, here on the East Coast, a bunch of lighthouses have been moved in the past 20, 30 years. Uh, on the West Coast, it's uh, it hasn't happened so much yet. But I was just talking a couple of weeks ago to um, Jen Lewis at the uh, Point Cabrillo Lighthouse in Northern California, and they're 
lighthouse is only 30 feet or so from the edge of the bluff and that that you know chunks of that bluff are, are going down uh mm-hmm. now and then uh so they're uh they're starting to talk about the possibility of moving that and i wonder if we're going to start hearing that with more west coast lights hopefully not yours anytime soon but we all have to think about these things with uh increasingly uh common bad storms and so forth uh, as as we move yeah. forward we're going to do what we can to prepare so let's let's switch back to Aquina Bay lighthouse again it was abandoned for quite a few years it had a real down period there uh i understand uh, there was talk of demolishing it uh, at, at one point do i have that right and how was it saved from being demolished uh, yeah, you're right. It was um, on the chopping block at one point. It kind of goes back to the 1940s um, there. And uh, eventually the the reservation that it's part of uh, was transferred to the uh, Oregon Highway Commission. And at that time, the Highway Commission was in charge of the parks that were in Oregon. And so it got developed as a byway or a park for the for the area. The CCC came in in the 1930s and really did an amazing job on kind of creating the site, making it um, a beautiful location for picnics, and they put walkways in and the tables and stuff like that. A man actually from Oregon that had gone to Ohio, made a fortune. Uh, his name was Ellie Warford. And he uh, was instrumental in bringing attention to the lighthouse itself. And through his efforts, the local population got excited about protecting it. And that's where the um, Lincoln County Historical Society steps in. I should mention, I haven't said it yet, but I was there in 2015, visited both lighthouse sites. And they're both absolutely beautiful places to visit that I recommend very highly. So everybody's done a a tremendous job there. Uh, So I want to move on to a subject that is kind of hard to avoid when talking about these two lighthouses. (laughs) I think you you know what I'm talking about. Both Yaquina Bay and Yaquina Head Lighthouse have developed uh, their ghost stories, their ghost legends, legends or stories, however you want to define them. Can either or both of you maybe talk about that a little bit? I have to say that (laughs) Um, For my organization, working with both agencies that manage um, the lighthouses, we are always encouraged to not (laughs) to write ghost stories. Um, And so I actually don't know a lot. I might be the only person who doesn't know a lot about um, Muriel, because I do know her name is the young girl that's supposed to haunt your Quinna Bay. But we are actively encouraged to snuff out any and all rumored ghosts. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but you know, it's it's interesting that you say that. I mean, I I'm involved with the lighthouse here on the New Hampshire Seacoast, Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, and we've been featured on national TV on the Ghost Hunters program and so forth. And there's there's stories there, but I I tend not to talk about them a lot unless people ask, and then I do it in in kind of a an open way, let people decide for themselves. These stories are very much the part of the fabric of a lot of these places, but uh, I know with our local lighthouse, I don't want it to be known as the haunted lighthouse. You know, it is a way of getting people hooked in into the place, and uh, hopefully, they want to learn more about the history. But I understand that officially. And I would say that we're Mm -hmm. approached at least twice a year, at least here at Yaquina Head, um, for people that want to come in and set up equipment or Mm -hmm. do Mm -hmm. some type of programming um, around the ghost stories. And I think some locations embrace them, and and rightly so, because you're correct, it, it can be a big draw. And if you're trying to raise money to save a light in a you know, in a lot of locations, it would be a really great thing to focus on to, to bring people in, you know, spark their interest and get yeah. them to support the restoration of them. So, Yeah, yeah. It's a fine line, though. Again, you don't want to be primarily known as the haunted lighthouse or whatever. <laughs> but do people ask at both places? Do people ask about those stories a lot? Yeah, people do ask um, at, at both places. There are several books out that mention the lighthouses. Most of the books are kind of back from the 70s and before, I'd say. Um, yeah. 
we've we've used social media and whatnot to kind of say hey folks you know we don't you know don't have a ghost here but there have been a few deaths you know there have been three keepers that have died on the location here um Mm -hmm. one was shadrick Wass, who was a sea captain and from maine uh and he um through again through the journals that we have um they recorded him being sick for several weeks and then eventually uh, he passed away in the house and his 17 year old daughter um, took over his shift until all the paperwork could go through for an official change in the keeper here at the spot. We did have um, a, some family members of some of the keepers uh, that were here around 1918, around that time. And they asked us, you know, not to continue these stories of of the ghosts if they weren't um, because they didn't believe they were real. You know? mm-hmm. So that's something we don't do. But, you know, we do mention, yeah, there have been some deaths here. Uh, a couple of the keepers have passed away. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, that, that's that's part of the events that happen here. The captain, there is a small cemetery about a mile away from the mm-hmm. station as well. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, I remember, uh, I think I'm remembering from my own research, I wrote a book uh, a number of years ago on West Coast Lights, a guide, kind of a handbook, a guidebook. And it seems to me, I remember that uh, there's a ghost story at Yaquina Bay that was actually uh, kind of grew out of a short story a woman wrote and people took it literally. They thought it was was true and it, it was just a story. Uh, so It's a good story. I've read it. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. great. And at a time when there, you know, perhaps weren't that many female authors writing, um, mm-hmm. quote unquote, horror um, stories. So, yeah, definitely um, the ghost story surrounding Yaquina Bay is much more um, developed than Yaquina Heads. Yeah. Well, I think we can probably move on from that from that subject, but thank you for being willing to talk about it a, a bit. So jumping ahead to more recent history, Aquina Bay Lighthouse became a working aid to navigation again in uh, 1996. Uh, how and why did that happen? Well, I think, you know, uh, because it had been going through some restoration and the interior of the keeper's um, house had been refurbished and really uh, made incredibly nice through the efforts of the uh, Lincoln County Historical Society that they wanted to kind of complete that and and get a light um, on there too. One of the people involved in that was uh, Jim Gibbs, who was uh, a local author. He lived in Yahats. He was previously a lighthouse keeper at Tillamook uh, Rock Lighthouse, and even to the, he wrote a lot of books, um, which are just great resource for us. We really appreciate his efforts. And he was the one that um, was able to obtain a light and get it put in uh, to the uh, Yaquina Bay Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And again, the the Coast Guard, it it, uh, consider it a a private aid to navigation and it's something that they now are looking after along with our life here at Yaquina Head. That's a great thing. I I second what you said about Jim Gibbs. The late Jim Gibbs uh, was a great author uh, and uh, did so much to keep uh, these stories alive, being a lighthouse keeper himself at Tillamook Rock, which is one of the most incredible places i think in america it must have been one of the most uh you know rugged places to be a, a keeper uh i have a bunch of jim gibbs books and uh i appreciate what he did so much andrew let me let me ask you a little bit more about the aquina head outstanding natural area under the bureau of land management uh what does it encompass what else is there besides aquina head uh what is there to see and, and do there Sure, sure. So the Yaquina uh, Head Outstanding Natural Area is uh, part of the Bureau of Land Management, and within that, it's part of a national uh, conservation land system. And it's kind of a special designation that's um, a little um, more geared towards um, scientific research, say, versus recreation. That's why we have our interpretive center is really a, a means to help educate folks on what is here. Uh, it's 
starting from the ground up, literally, uh, we have some really interesting geologic story and features here. And then um, it's a, a coastal kind of plain uh, with a variety of animals that you'll find, uh, you know, in the Northwest. We have deer and bears come through, coyotes, all that kind of stuff. But we and we also have our tide pools, which are uh, really uh, a unique feature and very rich in this area. Just the nature of the lava and its orientation towards the ocean and the rocks that protect that allow it to be a very rich tide pool. So that's something um, to come and explore. Uh, that's what brings a lot of our school groups and why we have such a, a strong education program here is is that focus of, of science and education. But on top of that, it's got another layer of being a great place to see whales on the migration of the California gray whales. So we mm -hmm. are uh, partnering with the Whale Watch gang or, or program that the Oregon State Parks run. And we also are looking at the shorebirds that are surrounding these rocks at Yaquina Head. And so we have even another layer, uh, whales, tide pools, and these shorebirds or seabirds that, that are often spend most of their life out in the open ocean. They come to our rocks, lay an egg without even a nest at times. And for folks to come and see, you know, thousands of birds up close is really uh, a unique experience. Mm-hmm. So it's got a lot offered for it. Um, it happens to have a great break. So uh, we have our local surfers come in every day. They're checking the surf, especially on the south side. They do uh, a lot of surfing off that. And then uh, we're even uh, looking at, in the future, uh, trying to make habitat for the Oregon silver spot butterfly. Hmm. which is a, a species of concern here in Oregon. Uh, they have very strict parameters of what they need to survive. And there's a great cooperation through the Oregon Zoo of having these uh, silver spot butterflies reintroduced. Uh, we're hoping to become one of those sites. It's so beautiful. You know, uh, I've seen most of both coasts in this country and the Oregon coast in general just stands out for me as a, uh, as beautiful as anything I've seen. Uh, and uh, what, a, what a great resource with uh, the wildlife and everything else and the, just the, the scenic beauty of that area. Let's talk a, a little bit more about the accessibility of these sites. First, uh, Yaquina Head Lighthouse is, of course, there's the interpretive center there. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that. And is the tower itself ever opened? Uh, yeah, prior to the... Um COVID um, experience that we've all had over the last couple of years, uh, we uh, provided tours um, throughout the day uh, for folks, about a 45 minute tour that was uh, a sign up type of situation. And folks, had, we had two tours an hour uh, that went up into the tower and the rangers timed it so you'd meet and be able to switch places and stuff. But it is a small indoor space and with, um, Everything that's happened the last couple of years, we've dropped back a little bit. Having that pause allowed us to uh, take a look at our uh, tower and we painted it for one thing over the last couple of years. We also had the ICC, the International Chimney Corporation come in and uh, they did some inspections. We determined we did want to do some work on the tower, especially at the top level. And so that's one of the reasons it hasn't been opened up 100% yet, but we are um, hoping to get there. Probably going to have smaller tours and maybe less frequent ones, uh, but we do plan to, uh, to have things open. I was just thinking of something I thought I'd point out that I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, the tower at Quinn Ahead is almost a twin of Pigeon Point Lighthouse in California. And I think sometimes people see one or the other in photos and get them confused. But is that accurate? Are they uh, almost twins or maybe you call yeah. them siblings? They're, yeah, they're, they're, that's accurate. Um, and the, the Lighthouse Service uh, provided blueprints for the lighthouses on the West Coast. And depending on your needs, uh, they would use those same blueprints in, in different places, maybe just altering the 
height of the tower or, or uh, some other element. Yeah. Well, on those uh, those two lights, uh, you went ahead and uh, Pigeon Point, you've got that service building attached to the tower at the, the base that are very, very similar, the two locations and the towers and lanterns themselves. Extremely similar. So uh, as uh, came up earlier, the you know, Quinnahead Lighthouse was established in 1873, making this the 150th anniversary. Is anything special planned for that? Yeah, we are definitely in the planning process for uh, this uh, coming August is when the illuminating apparatus was first lit August 20th. We're hoping to at least uh, take the whole weekend uh, to have some special events and uh, participating up to that point. We're going to be working with the Coast Guard. We hope to have them involved, um, the local historical society, and of course the state. We're really looking forward to it. Amy and the Friends of Aquina Lights are instrumental in, in helping us kind of plan and, and jump through some of the hurdles that we have to. So. Yeah, I can say on our end that I was blown away by the interest. I, I think internally, at least for myself and my staff, we celebrate the lighthouse's birthday every year. Um, we, we put a huge card out in the IC and we have people, you know, give the lighthouse birthday wishes and those are hung up on our walls here in the staff area. But the amount of interest that the 150th anniversary of the lighthouse has generated mm-hmm. was overwhelming. Um, we've actually had a local brewery um, contact us and they have a special brew that they have come up with um, dedicated to the lighthouse that's going to be available to the public on the 10th of February. And uh, they are donating 10% of all sales of that and a commemorative glass to the Friends of Quinn Lighthouses. So lots of community involvement, lots of interest um, from near and far. Uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be busy. Yeah. Be Excellent. <laughs> Oh, that's all great to hear. And I saw something on the website I was curious about, the Artists in Residence Program at Equina Head. What's that all about? Yeah, so the Artists in Residence Program is a national program. Um, it's been around for decades. As is sort of usual, um, the National Park Service, it, it's a little more developed for them, but the BLM does it as well. And so we started our first Artists in Residence or AIR program um, here in 2022. Uh, We selected a local artist, Emmy Surratt, who did Plain Air. Um, It was a wonderful experience for everybody. The local community support that we received was was huge. Um, Her presentation came on a typical Oregon Coast spring day. So think rain, fog, (laughs) wind. And we probably had 50 or 60 people brave that with their um, ponchos over over their... um, uh, paints out there all trying to participate in a big paint out so it it, it was great I, I, we partner with the Oregon Coast um, Council for the Arts as well so we have three partners in our local air program and uh, we will be doing it every year on an annual basis the friends group we provide um, two members myself and one of my board members are on the judging committee I do a lot of administrative duties to keep everything moving forward as it should um, and then we provide a stipend um, each week for the three-week um, course that it takes. We um, provide the artist a stipend so that mm-hmm. they're not out anything um, by participating. You know, I was thinking about how lighthouses, obviously, they're very much part of our, our history in this country, but they're also part of our cultural landscape, or our visual landscape, and uh, have been great subjects for for art and photography uh, over the years. So great to- Absolutely. To, yeah. Great to, to bring that in along with the, the history and the natural environment. So uh, just a little bit more about Yaquina Bay Lighthouse. Is it currently open to the public? It is not, but Oregon Parks and Recreation Department plan on reopening it to the public sometime in March. Historically, every winter, visiting hours were constricted anyway, just due to a lack of staff. So that's pretty normal. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that they are rearranging some of the historic furniture that's in it. They took advantage, as we did, um, of the COVID pandemic to really do a lot of house maintenance um, Mm -hmm. and tackle some projects inside there that don't make it a great fit for um, public walkthroughs right now. But as of March, um, they tell me that they will be opening the doors, at least on a part-time basis. 
Well, that's good. That's good. It's beautifully uh, presented inside the uh, the period furnishings and everything. I really enjoyed when I was there. Um, I hope to get back sometime and see what's what's changed. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I just have a couple more questions and these are for, for bonus points. Okay. So get your thinking caps on. The first uh, bonus question is what do you think the the two lighthouses, Yaquina Bay and Yaquina Head mean to the local community there in the, the area in general? I can start just from a small business perspective. I imagine if we went through town right now, we could probably spot at least 25% of our local businesses that's have the lighthouse in some way, shape, or form, either outside their building, on their letterhead, on their websites. And so just for a tourism, we are a service-based economy here. And just for the sheer number of visitors that it brings to our small community that spend those dollars that is then fed into all of our small businesses, it couldn't be overstated to say that it's just um, foundational, really, to our, our business community. Yeah. And you're talking more about Yaquina Head than Yaquina Bay. Uh, Though that both, sense, receive, both of them. Yeah, both receive a lot of interest. Um, I think Yaquina Head is it's a little more isolated and um, Yaquina Bay is able to be accessed 24 seven because it is one of those historical um, rest stops along 101. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe not as much interest, um, but I would say that it's near to equal. Yeah, yeah. Yaquina Head, I would just say, is one of those iconic type. You know, it's what people think of when they think of a lighthouse, the the white tower with the the black top on a on a dramatic bluff over the ocean. Dramatic's uh, the perfect word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah Yaquina Bay is great too. It's a very picturesque building, uh, but not quite the traditional lighthouse that people think of. So, Andrew, anything you'd like to add about uh, the the significance of those sites to the local area? Yeah, I'm. You know, having a lighthouse in your community is really, it's like a special thing. Not everybody has these. And it gives you a chance to reflect on on what your life was like previously. It will allow you to kind of ponder what it must have been like for the pioneers that were here, whether you're a native Oregonian whose family came across the trail in 46 or uh, whether you're um, thinking about all of the changes that happen with the way we do commerce and and that's what this lighthouse was here for was to uh, provide that shipping for uh, folks up and down the coast there are some great maritime museums we play a role in that history and and i think it's something that's important to share um, and i'm glad we have a chance to do that here yeah. So I have one final question for both of you, and this is for extra, extra bonus points. What is your favorite thing or things about your involvement with the Aquina Lighthouses? I would have to say my my favorite thing is perhaps the conversations that it inspires when somebody asks me what I do. Um, <laughs> being able to work in such a gorgeous place, being able to support that place and contribute um, to all of the programs and conservation of, of it is is a privilege. And I think it's a, for me personally, it's just been a wonderful ex- experience. You know, whenever you get down about something, all I need to do is look out my office window, <laughs> take a walk, you know, around the site and you're, you're instantly rejuvenated. And, and, and I, I really am, it, it's something in my life that is just a privilege. It really is. Where is your office? Uh, right in the interpretive center. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The that great. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andrew. For me, just being part of the history of this place now, you know, being a ranger here, uh, helping people discover uh, the history of the tower and and the location. I just enjoy being in it and cleaning. You know. Uh, I get to do some of the maintenance on the site as well. So it's really being able to be hands-on and to see families and kids come and, and just be amazed at this giant building out in uh, a far-off 
piece of the coast is just a, a really special thing to be able to share with other folks. And I've worked all over the country, uh, and I got to say that this is one of the the more wonderful places that I've been. I can believe that very easily. Beautifully said by both of you. And uh, again, uh, it's it's an incredible place. I recommend very highly to our listeners if they haven't been there. Uh, they got to go see those those two lighthouses. So it's a real pleasure speaking with both of you today, uh, Amy Anderson and Andrew Smalden. It's obvious how uh, much you love that place and how devoted you are to the uh, the history, the the structures themselves, the environment, and everything there. So uh, I really appreciate it, and I I want to uh, keep in touch and keep up with what's happening for the 150th anniversary of what went ahead this year. Uh, so thank you so much, Amy and Andrew. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll we'll keep in touch. You can learn more about Friends of Yaquina Lights online at yaquinalights.org. There's lots of information about both lighthouses on the site, and you can also do some shopping for t-shirts, baseball caps, and books, and a lot of other items. Can I get those baseball caps? <laughs> I've got, <laughs> I don't know how many, 20 or 30 at least, uh, lighthouse <laughs> baseball caps. Just ask my wife. Uh, as we <laughs> talked about earlier, these are great places to visit, these uh, two lighthouses. I have to say, uh, as uh, we also talked about, the Oregon coast in general is just one of the most spectacular coastlines I've ever seen. Boy, it sure is. I've driven up and down Highway 101 through Oregon so many times, and it is it is some pretty picturesque Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I drove the whole West Coast in 2015. In the spring of 2015, I flew out to San Diego, rented a little uh, Toyota Yaris, a little, little red <laughs> bug of a car, and uh, drove up the entire West Coast by myself over 30 days. Oh, and, man. Uh, yeah, it was, it was one of the trips of a lifetime. It was, it was pretty amazing. I even got no, up into no. British Columbia for, for the last several days. Um, but uh I would say the Oregon coast and the Northern California coast. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you, but I would say those are my two favorite parts. Uh, so. I agree. I agree. You know, when I first moved to Northern California, I fell in love with it because it reminded me of, of the coastline that I had visited up in Oregon too. You know, it's, it's those beautiful, rocky, craggy shorelines yes. that just make it so, so unique. I, I love I love that Northern California Oregon Coast vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here in New England, it's it's incredibly beautiful too. It's not better or worse. Uh, they're they're different, no, but both both coasts uh, <laughs> have a lot to offer. So, uh, speaking of the East Coast, we have another short segment today about an event that's coming up soon at Absecon Lighthouse in New Jersey. Yes, Absecon Lighthouse in Atlantic City is hosting its annual Evening of Romance and Renewal on February 11th, which is the Saturday before Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's a unique event they've been doing for some years now, I think around 10 or 12 years. I had a chance to speak with Jean Mushenik, who is the executive director of Absecon Lighthouse about the event. So let's listen to our conversation now. I'm speaking today with Jean Mushanik. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Jean? Yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I better not try it again. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, quit while I'm ahead on that. So uh, Jean is the executive director of Absecon Lighthouse in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Thanks so much for being with me today, Jean. Nice to be with you, Jeremy. Thank you. You're very welcome. So let, let's just, uh, I want to talk about this event that's coming up, but let's just start with a little bit of the basics. Where is Epsecon Lighthouse and what makes it so special? Okay, well, Epsecon Lighthouse is on Epsecon Island, which is the island that contains four towns, Atlantic City, Ventnor, Margate, and Longport. There also happens to be a mainland town called Epsecon. Um, but it's not on the island. However, every now and then we might get a call from Absecon saying, well, I'm in Absecon, I can't find your lighthouse. And we're <laughs> like, yeah. head to Atlantic City, we're over there. The word itself actually comes from an old Lenai Lenape uh, Native American word for little running waters, Absegami. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, I believe it's, uh, it's the tallest lighthouse in New Jersey, right? And it's yeah. actually 
something like the third tallest masonry tower in the United States, if I remember Yeah, right. that is correct. We're kind of tucked away off the boardwalk. We are two blocks from the boardwalk. We are in its original location. But what happened in the late 1800s is that the high tide watermark got so close to the foundation of the lighthouse that uh, it felt it was threatening the lighthouse. So the city did a landfill and built four stone and wooden jetties and pushed the land about two blocks out towards the ocean and a block and a half north. So mm -hmm. we're here, but we're just not on the beaten path of Atlantic City, which is the main thoroughfare of the boardwalk. But we're totally accessible, and a lot of people do find their way to visit us. Yeah, and you are open on a regular basis, right? Is it all year? It's open. Yes, we are open year round. We're only closed around two weeks of the Christmas and New Year's holiday time period. Other than that, we're open five days a week and every day in July and August, and open late on Thursdays in the summer as well. Mm -hmm. I do want to interview interview you at more length in the future, but let me ask you about the evening of romance and renewal. Nice. What is it and when does it happen? Well, Jeremy, this event is happening this year on Saturday, February 11th. And this we've had this event for several years. I've been here 18 years in 2007 after I got my third phone call at the lighthouse. Hey, we'd like to get married there. And do you know somebody who can marry us? I'm like, I think I'll become the person who can marry people. So I applied and got, you know, my wedding officiate license and all that kind of good stuff. And then um, Atlantic City Convention Center was looking for a wintertime event because, of course, we're kind of a summertime town. They invited me to be the officiate for group vow reno uh, group wedding and vow renewal ceremony when they kind of folded the event because by then. People knew that Atlantic City was a destination for Valentine's Day. I asked if I could bring it to the lighthouse. And with their blessing, of course, they said yes. So it's been several years we've been doing this. And so what we do is we set up a wedding arch so people can have pictures. We bring in a DJ so there can be romantic dancing. We have champagne and some other soft libations just for fun. We have a romantic climb because it's still dark out around that time period we're doing this. So um, and then people, we, we just actually all gather together in the museum area and uh, people take off their wedding rings and then we do their vows all over again and they have a nice smooch, which is customary, of course. And then we have a special song and champagne toast. So it's, it's a lot of fun and it's a fundraiser for us. So yeah, people enjoy it. Oh, it sounds, sounds really great. You know, I was thinking aside from all the other wonderful things about that, it's just, it's always fun. It feels special to be at a lighthouse in the evening or at night. Um, there's something special about that because not everybody gets to do that. That is true. Day. Yeah. So. And we're lucky enough. Um, you had originally asked me, you know, tell me a little something about what makes your lighthouse special. And one of those things is that we still have our original first order Fresnel lens still in place <laughs> at the top. So when you climb for a night climb, there are chimney lights on the treads of the stairs to get to the top of the lighthouse. But yep. you're actually also going to encounter when you look up and see this first order Fresnel lens, which is lit by two 300 watt light bulbs at night. So it's it's quite amazing. And it's it's really special and spectacular to be able to see it up close like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, I would say the Fresnel lenses are beautiful works of functional art. And to have a, a first order lens still in, still in place is, is special. There aren't many of them, as you know. That Only a handful true. on the East Coast, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So um, the evening of Romance and Renewal, uh, you've done it for a number of years, right? How many How many years, do you know? Yes, um, since around 2010, I want to say. So we're, mm -hmm. we're into our 13th year during the pandemic years. We kind of switched things up a little bit and did it in time slots in the afternoon and then virtually for people. Um, so that was fun. This is our first year that that we're getting back together all together in the museum area uh, to exchange vows. So, but um, sometimes the date lands on actual Valentine's Day, but we do choose usually the weekend before or after because that's when people are actually making our dinner reservations a lot. So it's a $40 donation to the lighthouse, but we also say you can give from the heart. 
So a lot of times to have your vows renewed, it's a lot more money than $40 if you go to a different yeah. <laughs> location or with a different um, officiate. So a lot of people give from the heart. So it really is a good fundraiser for us. And I just think the theme of, you know, just spreading the love however you can in the world is a good thing. So we're just so happy to do it for people and everyone leaves with a smile on their face and that makes us happy as well. Well, I, I second that about spreading the love. That's a, a good cause for, yeah. for sure. So how do people make a res reservation to take part in this? Sure, just call the lighthouse and our number is 609-449-1360. We have plenty of room at this moment. I was a little worried last week about, well, no, we're not getting reservations. And my coworker, his name is Milt. And he said, Gene, trust me, you have to wait for the calendar to turn to February 1st. And then all of a sudden, all the guys go, what am I going to do for <laughs> Valentine's Day? So we've actually had more calls come in recently. So phew, on that, I'm sure we'll have a full house by the time it's all ready next uh, on the 11th. Yeah, we're actually talking on uh, January 27th. People will be hearing this later, just uh, okay. gotcha. a couple of days before the event. So okay. uh, by that time, you may might be full, but people are interested. They can still We have still a huge try. porch. I'll, t I'll invite everybody. We'll make it work for <laughs> You can do it in shifts, but if anybody wants okay. to come to Atlantic City and experience this, we'll make it work for you. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So as I mentioned to you before we started the interview, Jean, I, I do hope to, uh, I do plan to feature Absecon in more depth in a future episode. Today, we're just scratching the surface. I mainly right. wanted to talk about this event to get it on uh, the podcast yeah. be just before it happens. But I'm also hoping I might be able to visit you this summer, maybe in June, and maybe That'd we can uh, speak in person and uh, yeah. looking forward to that. It's really so, nice because yeah. when people get here, they're like, you see pictures online, but because it is, you know, the third tallest in the country, all of a sudden when you're standing right next to it and looking up, you just, it's like a wow factor. So yeah. I can't wait for you to come and see it. Yeah, well, I've climbed some of the other tallest lighthouses in the country, but I haven't climbed yours, so I need to do that. Okay. So, Jean Mushenik, yeah. uh, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank we'll talk again. Again, you can make a reservation for the evening of romance and renewal by calling 609-449-1360. It sounds like a really cool event. It definitely is. I'm not going to be there for that, but I do hope to get to the New Jersey Shore this summer, possibly in June, for some podcast interviews and to shoot some uh, video and photos. We want to remind everyone to check out U.S. Lighthouse Society's website, uslhs.org, to learn more about all the things the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers, including tours, preservation grants, and the passport program. And of course, I want to remind people to visit pointcabrillo.org, P-O-I-N-T-C-A-B-R-I-L-L-O.org to learn more about my lighthouse, the Point Cabrillo Lighthouse. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty special place. And I'd say it's not a bad place to work. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> I know you do, and I don't blame you. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you so much for co-hosting today, Jen. It was a real pleasure. I look forward to having you take part in the podcast, uh, I'm sure, in future episodes and also other USLHS events in the future. Of course. It's always a pleasure chatting with you, Jeremy. So next week's episode will feature an interview with the owner of the amazingly spectacular Clare Island Lighthouse in Ireland. For now, as always, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thank you so much for listening and keep a good light. Keep a good light.